because this case is a notable contract law authority, it is also a great example of a situation where equity will not intervene to assist an inequitable party. Characteristically, the words of Lord Denning in this case summarise the facts, relevant rules and judgment very well. The Master of the Rolls, Lord Denning. DNC Builders Limited are a little company. D stands for Donaldson, a decorator. C for Casey, a plumber. They are jobbing builders. The defendant has a shop where he sells builders materials. In the spring of 1964, the defendant employed the plaintiffs to do work at his premises. 218 Brick Lane. The plaintiffs did the work and rendered accounts in May and June, which came to £746.13. The defendant paid £250 on account. In addition, the plaintiffs made an allowance of £14 off the bill. So in July 1964, there was, owing to the plaintiffs, the sum of £482. At this stage, there was no dispute as to the work done, but the defendant did not pay. On the 31st of August 1964, the plaintiffs wrote asking the defendant to pay the remainder of the bill. He did not reply. On the 19th of October 1964, they wrote again, pointing out that the outstanding account of £480 is well overdue. Still, the defendant did not reply. He did not write or telephone for more than three weeks. Then, on Friday the 13th of November 1964, the defendant was ill with influenza. His wife telephoned the plaintiffs. She spoke to Casey. She began to make complaints about the work, and then said, My husband will offer you £300 in settlement. That is all you'll get. It is to be in satisfaction. Mr Casey said he would have to discuss it with Mr Donaldson. The two of them talked it over. Their company was in desperate financial straits. If they did not have the £300, they would be in a state of bankruptcy. So they decided to accept the £300 and see what they could do about the rest afterwards. Thereupon, Mr Donaldson telephoned to the defendant's wife. He said to her, £300 will not even clear our commitments on the job. We will accept £300 and give you a year to find a balance. She said, No, we will never have enough money to pay the balance. £300 is better than nothing. He said, We have no choice but to accept. On Saturday the 14th of November 1964, Mr Casey went to collect the money. He took with him a receipt, prepared on the company's paper, with the simple words, Received the sum of £300 from Mr Rees. She gave him a cheque for £300 and asked for a receipt. She insisted that the words, Incompletion of the account, be added. Mr Casey did as she asked. He added the words to the receipt. Mr Casey gave in evidence his reason for giving it. If I did not have the £300, the company would have gone bankrupt. The only reason we took it was to save the company. She knew the position we were in. This case is of some consequence, for it is a daily occurrence that a merchant or tradesman who is owed a sum of money is asked to take less. The debtor says he is in difficulties. He offers a lesser sum in settlement, cash down. He says he cannot pay more. The creditor is considerate. He accepts the proffered sum and forgives him the rest of the debt. The question arises, is the settlement binding on the creditor? The answer is that in point of law, the creditor is not bound by the settlement. He can the next day sue the debtor for the balance and get judgment. The law was so stated in 1602 by Lord Coke in Pinnell's case and accepted in 1889 by the House of Lords in Folks and Beer. This doctrine of the common law has come under heavy fire. But a remedy has been found. The harshness of the common law has been relieved. Equity has stretched out a merciful hand to help the debtor. It is the first principle upon which all courts of equity proceed that if parties, who have entered into definite and distinct terms involving certain legal results, afterwards, by their own act, or with their own consent, enter upon a course of negotiation which has the effect of leading one of the parties to suppose that the strict rights arising under the contract will not be enforced, or will be kept in suspense, or held in abeyance, the person who otherwise might have enforced those rights 
will not be allowed to enforce them when it would be inequitable, having regard to the dealings which have taken place between the parties. It is worth noticing that the principle may be applied, not only so as to suspend strict legal rights, but also as to preclude the enforcement of them. So much that we can now say that, when a creditor and a debtor enter upon a course of negotiation, which leads the debtor to suppose that, on payment of the lesser sum, the creditor will not enforce payment of the balance, and on a faith thereof, the debtor pays the lesser sum and the creditor accepts it as satisfaction, then the creditor will not be allowed to enforce payment of the balance when it would be inequitable to do so. In applying this principle, however, we must note the qualification. The creditor is only barred from his legal rights when it would be inequitable for him to insist upon them. Where there has been a true accord under which the creditor voluntarily agrees to accept a lesser sum in satisfaction, and the debtor acts upon that accord by paying the lesser sum, and the creditor accepts it, then it is inequitable for the creditor afterwards to insist on the balance. But he is not bound unless there has been truly an accord between them. In the present case, on the facts as found by the judge, it seems to me that there was no true accord. The debtor's wife held the creditor to ransom. The creditor was in need of money to meet his own commitments, and she knew it. When the creditor asked for payment of the £480 due to him, she said to him, in effect, We cannot pay you the £480, but we will pay you the 300 if you accept it in settlement. If you do not accept it on those terms, you will get nothing. £300 is better than nothing. She had no right to say any such thing. She could properly have said, we cannot pay you more than £300. Please accept it on account. But she had no right to insist on his taking it in settlement. When she said, we will pay you nothing unless you accept £300 in settlement, she was putting undue pressure on the creditor. She was making a threat to break the contract by paying nothing, and she was doing it so as to compel the creditor to do what he was unwilling to do, to accept £300 in settlement. And she succeeded. He complied with her demand. In these circumstances, there was no true accord so as to found a defensive accord and satisfaction. There is also no equity in the defendant to warrant any departure from the due course of law. No person can insist on a settlement procured by intimidation. In my opinion, there is no reason in law or equity why the creditor should not enforce the full amount of the debt due to him. I would, therefore, dismiss this appeal. Lord Justice Dankworth added, In the circumstances of the present case, there was no true accord. Mr and Mrs Rees really behaved very badly. And now it's time for all new Rory Mayo's Top Tips. Rory Mayo's Top Tips. In the case of DNC Builders v Rees, the judges referred to Pinnell's case 1602 on part payment of a debt. This case is authority for the point of law that part payment of a debt is never satisfaction of a debt in full. However, it is worth remembering the words of Lord Coke. Payment of a lesser sum on the day in satisfaction of a greater cannot be any satisfaction for the whole, because it appears to the judges that by no possibility a lesser sum can be a satisfaction to the plaintiff for a greater sum. But the gift of a horse, hawk or robe in satisfaction is good, for it shall be intended that a horse, hawk or robe might be more beneficial to the plaintiff than the money.